Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, and welcome, welcome to the second day of of FOSDEM. Um, I must say I'm uh, incredibly uh, privileged to be able to speak in front of you all. Um, and the only problem is, of course, that the acoustics of this room are like being in a swimming bath at the bottom of a deep well. So uh, if you can't hear me, uh, please uh, um, ask me to shout up. And the other thing I'd like to say is if you would like to ask questions, please feel free to ask questions at any time during the talk. Um, theoretically, there'll be people running around with microphones um, to uh, record your question for the streaming. But don't worry, even if you don't get the microphone in time, because I will repeat the question so that the streaming will be able to capture it. So, um, my name is Jeremy Allison, and I work for Google in the open source program office in California in Mountain View on the big Google campus. But having said that, forget anything um, I, I mentioned to do with Google. This is not a Google talk. It has not been vetted by Google Legal or even seen by um, Google Legal. So um, please don't take anything I say as um, anything on behalf of Google. Um, and don't, don't hold my very poor jokes against them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so having said that, what I'm going to talk about today is the Samba 4 release, um, um, which is the fourth major release of the Samba project. Um, and we did that just before Christmas. And so I'm going to fill you in a little bit about the background. At the beginning of the talk, it's not terribly technical. Um, it gets a little more technical going further on. Um, but I can actually drill down into any technical issues that people might want to raise or might want to ask. Or if I don't know the answer, I have some very capable Samba team members sitting in the front row, so I can always cop out and defer uh, the questions to them, which really helps. So Samba, is first of all, is there anyone here who doesn't know what Samba is? Just thought I'd better check. Uh, thank you, yes, the Samba team guys. Uh, well, I'm, I'm glad about that, um, because, you know, uh, commonly the uh, impression I get is, you guys, you're still going? I, didn't you die out a long time ago? Um, this is disco, man. We never die. Um, so we're a very old project. We actually predate Linux itself. Uh, when we started, um, we, our major platform was Sunos um, 4, not even Solaris yet, um, and HPUX and AIX. Uh, Linux at the time was not very interesting to us because it didn't have a network stack. So, um, as I say, we've, we've been around for a very long time. Uh, and back in the days when, I don't know whether anyone remembers this, does anyone remember the days when you could buy Red Hat Linux as a box set at your local store? Cool. So, so you remember at the time it used to have little stickers on it saying, comes with Samba 2 dot whatever and, you know, Apache 1 dot something. Um, those were the days um, when a, a release of Samba version number used to be printed on the side of the Linux box. These days, I, I think we've probably become more part of the infrastructure. Um, and so the perception is that Samba's been around a long time. We're kind of an old and boring project. There's not much exciting going on. And I'm, I'm here to disabuse you of that. I'm here to uh, excite you about Samba again and get you all to contribute. Um, because we're, we're, we're not quite as bad as Pearl. We're still going. Um, so, you know... Does, does anyone need a local file server anymore? Doesn't everybody just upload from their mobile phones into the cloud and let everything take care of it? You know, um, so how many people here actually do use cloud storage? Yeah, quite, quite a few. I mean, you know, I, I must confess I, I have my music collection up in the cloud so that I can stream it wherever I go, um, you know, bandwidth permitting. Um, but how many people also have uh, actual local storage at home? Ah, yes. So that's where we come in, you see. Um, there, there are still very good reasons for having a file server in your closet or indeed a, a file server in your enterprise. Um, you know, I mean, at least for the, home, um, for the home products, there's a couple of reasons why you still kind of need um, local storage. One of them might be that you might have some files that you might not, let's just say you might not feel comfortable 
uploading to your cloud service provider um, for one reason or another. Um, so that was, I, I always like the uh, LP, and I, I can't remember the band that did it, that came printed with the home taping is killing music and is illegal, and they managed to slip a cassette tape into the vinyl, into the sleeve, and it said, and here's a, here's a, a, a cassette so you can help. <laughs> um, and the other reason is, how, how many people recognize the object on the right? Oh, very cool. How many people actually used one? Ooh, less, less so. Uh, my, my first, that's actually for people who don't recognize it, what that is, is an acoustic coupler. Uh, a modem, the very, very first kinds of modems, where you actually plugged the physical telephone set into a coupler to get access to the, well, it wasn't the internet then, it was your local bulletin board system. My, my first modem actually looked very much like that and had the massive speed of uh, 1,200 board down, um, down um, stream and 75 upstream. Um, so the other reasons that cloud storage can be a little tricky is that you know, there are areas in the world where that would be considered a lot of bandwidth. So it's kind of hard to copy multi-terabyte files around um, when you're having to do things through something like that. So having local file storage is actually quite useful. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, so where, what happened to Samba? You know, what happened to you, man? We, we used to be close, as they say. Where, where did you go? Well, we hid and kind of thrived here. So um, I, I imagine there's, there's a, a wonderful ele electronic shop in Silicon Valley called Fry's. Does, has anyone ever been there or heard of it? Or? Few people, very good. It's, it, it's like a warehouse full of electronics and electronic goods. And I once wandered around the network attached storage section and literally every single product on the shelf, the network attached storage shelf, it had Samba inside. None of them said it, of course, the days of having sort of Samba X on the box are long gone, but every single one of those was actually running a version of Samba inside. Oh, thank you very much, Ubuntu. <laughs> God damn it. You know how careful it yes, an online account. God. I thought I'd turn that off. Anyway, never mind. Um, hope it's not going to keep doing that to me during the talk. Um, so we actually went and hid in the network attached storage market. And we've actually thrived um, quite well down there. Uh, so the, the one I really find amazing, does anyone recognize that little device up on the top left? Anyone? So what it is, uh, I know it's a little hard to see from where you are, it's actually a little, what they call a wart, which has an Ethernet port in one end and a USB port in the other. And so you take your USB drive that you buy, you plug it into that, you plug the network cable into that thing, and it's a file server. It's Linux and Samba in this just incredibly tiny little box. So we scale from things like that, which will turn any of the portable um, USB drives you might buy in places like Fry's into a, a NAS, portable NAS server, to things like that. Does anyone recognize the, the object on the, on the right? It's kind of specific. I stole it from their, uh, from their advertising website. Um, that's actually an IBM Sonas system called Scale Out Network Attached Storage. And that's one of those products which I love from IBM where if you have to ask how much it is, you can't afford it. So, um, but that also runs Samba, and that thing scales out to just unbelievable, ungodly amounts of storage. Um, it's used by movies, movie producers who are writing 4K, you know, frames, and they're they're putting one frame um, in each, in a separate file for you know. 25 or 80 frames a second or whatever the, the rate is. So they just need phenomenal amounts of bandwidth, phenomenal amounts of storage. And that's Samba 2. So I, I, like, to, uh, I like to joke that any network attached storage costing less than $20,000 or more than a million has Samba in it. Um, but the mid-range is still kind of colonized by EMC and NetApp um, for some strange reason. But uh, So we, we actually do extraordinarily well in, in the network attached storage market. And primarily, um, we had a, a lot of tension at the beginning of the product, project. Are we a product that you would buy, sort of like, you know, Samba with new washers, whiter brand, or are we a kit of parts for building other products? And I, I think that's kind of firmly come down 
on the understanding that what we are is a kit of parts that other people use to build products. And actually, I, I'm, I'm, quite, I'm quite happy about that, because it means I don't have to focus on writing management interfaces, which are really hard, and we suck at doing anyway. If, has anyone used SWAT? Yes. Uh, yeah, yes, so you know how bad we are. Uh, security release came out last week. So yes, we really don't want to be in the business of doing management interfaces. We want to be doing file serving and other interesting things. So what took us so long? Um, so I, I used to joke that uh, we were taking a long time to write Samba 4, but at least we were going to come out before Duke Nukem Forever. Um, and then they finished Duke Nukem Forever. <laughs> now, it was a terrible game, but it, it was really sad that they actually finished the, the classic vaporware product uh, before we finished doing Samba 4. Um, so there are actually many reasons for that, um, which I'm going to go into um, before I actually start talking about what's in Sam before. And essentially, we, we had some challenges with it. Um, and um, overcoming those challenges can actually take quite a long time. So has anyone heard of a boil the ocean project? Anyone heard the phrase boil the ocean? Ah, okay, a few of you. It was commonly used by, by ex-Sun Microsystems engineers where they were talking about when software designers sit down and try and design new things, they keep adding features and saying, well, wouldn't it be cool if it would do that? And wouldn't it be cool if it would do that? And by the end of it, you have a project that essentially to run would need enough power that you would have to boil the ocean in order to, uh, to successfully run it. And Sam before started to head in that direction. Um, there were more and more pieces being added, um, and it started to do more and more, and it, it, it kind of spiraled a little bit out of control for a while. And it's to the great credit of uh, many of the Samba team members who worked on it that eventually they managed to rein back the ambitions and say, okay, we really have to get this thing out before the end of the next millennium, so let's start cutting features, let's start saying, you know, this works as well as it's going to for now, we'll, we'll finish the rest of it later. And, and they, they managed to cut it down to a, a more manageable, well, theoretically more manageable size of, of project. Um, the other thing that nearly happened that we managed to avoid, which I'm very glad about, is we nearly ended up forking the project. And that's happened once before, and it's very painful. So how many here have worked on a project that forked? Anyone? Yeah, a few people. It's, if you don't work on a project and you don't know, essentially it's like going through a divorce, but you know, kind of uglier. Um, and uh, so each set of developers takes their tools and goes home and takes copies of the code and says, well, you guys suck. We're going to do it our way. And what was happening, uh, at least within Samba, for a long while was there was the Samba, what were called the Samba 3 guys, which was, I was one of those guys, which were the kind of the older developers who were working on the file serving project, who were working on the file server part of it, the piece that we used in the network attached storage, and then there were the Samba 4 guys who were going to replace everything in Samba 3 and going to do it better and, you know, going to rewrite everything from scratch. It was going to be better, cleaner, faster. They were going to have Active Directory in as well. You know, and we started to drift apart. And you can actually still see that if you download our source code in that we have source 3 and source 4 directories still. But the wonderful thing now is that we need both of those directories to actually build the entire project. Um, and what we're slowly doing is we're moving the pieces out of those directories into a, the top level source directory. And, and hopefully, eventually, the source 3 and source 4 directories will be legacy that we will eventually manage to remove. And that took a lot of effort. That was a, a hard thing to achieve. Um, people, people had to kill parts of the code that they were very, very fond of. And nobody likes to do that. And it's to the great credit of many people that they were, they were able to, uh, to fix that. So before we managed to remerge everything, and, and this is one of the reasons, of course, why we ended up taking so long to get the project out. Um, so, there were two file servers. Samba 4, uh, the, the, Samba 4, the Source 4 branch originally started with an attempt to rewrite the file server as a pluggable, very clean, asynchronous engine um, that 
uh, was called the NTVFS, standing for the Windows NT Virtual File System. And then the SMB, SMBD, which was the Samba 3, the Source 3 version of it, was essentially older. But the thing is, what happened is, as the code was developed, as new ideas were created in Source 4, we kept stealing them and bringing them back into Source 3. So essentially, their ideas still won. It's just that they ended up being merged back into the original code base. So how many people have actually worked on a, pro a project that said, OK, we're going to rewrite everything from scratch, replace it, and it actually worked? OK, very well. What, what was the project? I'm just kind of curious. A, a small Python application, yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, there was another person who put the hand up? Was there? Ah, uh, sorry. Oh, X386 was that. I, I, I don't believe that was a rewrite. I, that was, no. So it, it, I think that's probably more similar to, to Samba itself. It was a, a fork that took over, but it wasn't an actual rewrite. So what happens is when you have a very large, successful project um, that's being used by many, many people, it's really hard to write it from scratch and replace it. Um, this is actually one of the things that some of the Microsoft engineers have written some very good books about. It's much easier to take that old code base and refactor it, clean it up, and keep it running because at least at that point you have interested customers who are testing it. It's much harder to take a brand new code base and reproduce everything that the original code base, code base did. And those, those projects don't tend to succeed most of the time. And so that's pretty much what happened here in that the file server piece migrated the good parts of the NTVFS file server migrated back into SMBD. Um, the other piece, uh, we still have two Winbind daemons, which are the authentication daemons that talk to a domain controller. Um, the second one, Right now, we've managed to contain it. We still had to have it simply because we didn't have the time to merge the two in the time frame that we had to finish, to actually get a release out. So what we have is we have uh, a windbind that is used on member servers and members of a domain, which is the standard windbind that people are used to. And then we have a smaller, uh, more focused windbind that only runs on the Active Directory domain controller. It is our ultimate goal to merge those two demons, but we're, right now we're just having to live with it. Um, and then there were many, many utility libraries. There was a whole replacement parameter library. There were sets of replacement string libraries. And you know, many of the people working on Source 4, they went through, and you know, massive credits to them, they, they did the hard work of merging that stuff together so that we can use common libraries. Sometimes we chose the Source 4 version. Sometimes we chose the Source 3 version. But there was a lot of work, a, a lot of a compound asynchronous code, a, a whole new set of event mechanisms that were invented that eventually came back together in top-level libraries. And you can see the fruits of this in the T-event libraries and other things that have come and spun out of the Samba project. And the other part, part was actually learning to review each other's code and not scream at each other in, in meetings again and, and to actually say, you know, that guy actually does write good code even though he's a jerk who works on SMBD and I hate him, you know. And, and that kind of thing, as I'm sure you know, is a very hard thing to, to once you've pushed yourselves apart, it's hard to get back together again. Uh, and yeah, a lot of egos got trampled. There's, there's still a lot of seething resentment underneath the uh, under surface, of course. As I like to say, the, the Samba project and the Samba team is the, class, is the master of passive-aggressive, you know, well, if you don't like my code, then I suppose you better use yours kind of attitude. But it does, it does eventually uh, work, and, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're getting better and a little, more, um, a little more used to each other again. And that's really is the hard part. Um, ah, so I may have already talked a lot about this. Um, there are... Yes, so the, uh, I, actually I kind of already covered a lot of the things on this slide. Um, the really hard requirement, the one that we laid down had to happen, was no matter what we were doing in creating the new version, you had to be able to take an existing Samba installation, you had to be able to type make install and run a script, and it had to keep working. Um, or at least there had to be minimal disruptions to people's existing Samba installations and file server installations. It's, it's not completely seamless, 
but there have been a lot, has been a lot of work put in to actually making that migration path work. And, and one of the reasons for that is the people who create network attached storage devices, um, they have a very stable code base they're used to working with. We would like them, obviously, to move to the new features that we have in Samba 4.0. Um, and we've done that by basically providing them with extra new flashy features that we think they'll want. But we couldn't force a massive change on them. We couldn't say, and of course, you'll have to throw away all your configuration management tools. Everything has to change, um, and you'll have to do everything a completely different way. So the hard requirement is that we, we didn't want to make the OEM suffer a massive amount of disruption. Because to be honest, many of us work for those OEMs. And so you know, it's in our interest to, to make sure that everything keeps working. Um, there's still some ongoing discussions on how to make the AD piece work, how to separate some pieces. I'll go into that a little, little bit later on uh, in the talk. Um, but like I say, things, things are getting back together, and we now, we now have one code base, which I'm really quite happy about. So what are the actual new features? I mean, I've been talking about Samba 4.0, but what is it? What's the new thing? Well, the really big new thing is that it's a full Active Directory domain controller replacement. And I mean, you can migrate from an existing Active Directory uh, Microsoft, you can replicate to a Samba one, you can promote the Samba one, and it will keep, you can then turn off the Microsoft one, it will keep working. And you can do the reverse. You know, if people want to migrate from Samba, uh, the old, um, the Samba 3.0 uh, LDAP based domain controller, you can migrate it to Samba 4, and then you can replicate to the Windows one, and you can then turn off the Samba one. So it actually works both ways. Um, the other, thing is that's really, the other thing that's really cool is that it actually integrates seamlessly with all the Windows domain controller tools. So, uh, and this is for the Windows guys. I mean, I'm not a domain administrator, or I haven't been for about 10 or 15 years now. Um, but all of the tools that those people use, like group policy editors, etc., they all work against a Samba 4 domain controller. So that's very, very cool. There's still, um, you know, because we're... Unix and Linux and command line based people. There's Samba tool that actually configures things on the command line so that you can do this um, inside uh, your Linux box, of course. Uh, we thought about putting all those options into the net binary, which had become our kitchen sink of administration tools, and uh, luckily decided this was a terrible idea and we weren't going to do it. Um, so, how many people here have heard of Microsoft's new SMB 2 and 3? Okay, not that many. So Microsoft have um, had an, S an SMB SIFS protocol for many years. It's the one that Windows XP uh, out of the box uses. They actually did a lot of work and rewrote the protocol, created a new protocol called SMB2, which we fully supported in Samba 3.6. And now they've added a bunch of new clustering features to make a SMB3. They were going to call it SMB2.2, um, but it was such a, a radical change, their marketing people got them to call it Samba, uh, SMB3 instead. Um, and so we actually have preliminary support for that, and I'll go into what that means a little bit later on. Um, the other thing is we got serious about using it, all the extra cores that you have on your servers, and so the I.O. paths within Samba are now completely parallel. So S Samba itself, at least the file server engine, is essentially an asynchronous state machine that uses threads under the covers to get multiple paths for I.O. going onto disk. So it's kind of easy to understand in terms of, well, as much as a state machine can be, um, in terms of how to program it, and yet it still has the flexibility to use threads in the places where you really need it. Um, and Microsoft introduced some new handle types that um, will cover uh, disconnection, failover, and we're starting to support those. That came out only in Samba 4.0, and there'll be more fuller support for that in Samba 4.1. Um, so, who, who here actually administers an Active Directory? Anyone? Oh, there's, there, that's great. There's still some people here who use Windows. That's, I thought everyone had gone to Android and uh, Mac and Linux these days. But yeah, for you legacy guys like me, um, yeah. Uh, so for everyone else, essentially, Active Directory is those, it, it's many more, more things, of course, but it's essentially an LDAP server, a dynamic DNS server, a 
Kerberos KDC, a file server, and a DC RPC services. Um, it's all those things. But the main thing it has is a central data store. And that's, that's very important. And that's, that's what actually, um, that's what actually uh, drove a lot of the design decisions in creating Samba 4. So, okay, there's all those five things, right? So you've got open LDAP, there's your LDAP server. You've got bind, there's your DNS server. You've got MIT and Heimdall Kerberos, choose one, there's your KDCs. Then actually you've got the open group DCE source code, so there's your DC RPC, and then Samba um, covers the SIFS part. So we just integrated those all together and we were done, right? Well, so there was a proprietary product um, called Zad from a guy, Luke Howard, who's a very, uh, very clever guy, now living in Berlin, um, playing music. Um, he did that. Um, it was a lot of work, did a wonderful job. We chose a different path. Why? <laughs> so, we, uh, yeah, we, we created all our own code for every single one of those subsystems. So we have our own LDAP server, we have our own DNS server, we have our own KDC embedded in uh, Samba we already had, and we didn't use the DC RPC code. The only one I feel happy about is not using the DC, oh, is the Open Group's DC RPC code, because that code sucks. Uh, and was never properly security audited. There have been many other products that have used it. I think Apple uses it in their uh, in their version of uh, S an SMB2 server, SMB1, SMB2 server. I don't trust that code. It was basically, it's old proprietary code that got thrown over the wall about five years ago. Nobody, to my knowledge, has done a security audit on it. Nobody's done a review of it. I don't trust that code. Um, there's probably horrors lurking in there that we will be seeing CVEs for the next 10 years on. Um, you know, if anyone actually goes into it. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy that we ended up using our own there. But for the rest of it, well, why did we do it? <sighs> why did we do it? Uh, so there's no single really good reason. There's not one thing you, or one person or one thing you can point out and say, it's their fault, they did it, that's why we did it. <sighs> the most common issue, the, the thing that was brought up the most that ended up getting us to do this was the need for a common data store. And it's hard to coordinate the backend data storage for all those different products into one place. And remember, Active Directory requires that you can set a password via LDAP and read it via DCE or update a password via Kerberos and then you know, have it uh, enforced via all the other subsystems. ACLs magically appear when you create objects, and inheritance has to work when you create objects inside the LDAP database. So it's not just a matter of saying, well, stitch all these products together and you have all the pieces that you need. It's much more complex than that. Zad had the luxury, basically, of shipping modified custom versions of all these things stitched together into a product. We didn't have that luxury. We would have had to upstream everything. And that was not so easy. Uh, and so, more reasons. Um, so Tridge, how many people here know Tridge? Okay, so, so um, he's not been active recently, so he's kind of semi-retired, but if you know him, Tridge uh, was once uh, listed as the smartest man in Australia, I actually believe that, and he's the really smart part of, of Samba, so Tridge and I are credited with creating Samba, but anyone who's talked to both of us knows that one of them is smart and one of them is me. So <laughs> Tridge spent, and I'm not going to name the subsystems, but in development in Samba 4, he actually spent a week trying to get two components to work together. Uh, I will say that cryptography was involved, just to give you a hint. He managed to make it work. It took him a week to figure out what versions would build with what libraries to make the things actually work. And at that point, he realized, we, you know, even if we have... Uh, and I don't know how many of you were here for Simo's talk yesterday. Simo did a wonderful talk on SSSD, but he pointed out that in order to configure the things that you need to for free IPA, I think it was, you have 96 separate steps that you have to do to integrate all these pieces. 
You, you can't expect admins to do that. I mean, if, it would be like saying, here's Samba 4, and then upending a box of Lego bricks all over the floor and saying, yeah, go build it yourself. It's easy. Um, so actually building some of those pieces ourselves meant that we could actually ensure that those things were integrated, um, although it, it does kind of suck. Um, so we needed to make invasive changes in upstream product, projects that we weren't necessarily sure would be welcome at the time. So Microsoft made specific changes to Kerberos to embed what they call a privilege authentication certificate in the uh, tickets that they were generating. So that meant upstream changes to Kerberos to embed Windows SIDs into you know, a standard MIT or Heimdall KDC. And you know, quite rightly, those guys would say, well, where are we going to get them from? Why do we need them? And bugger off, basically. Uh, whereas the Samba 4 version of it, which is actually a copy of the Heimdall source um, imported into Samba, we cre can create those transparently as needed. And the other thing uh, that took a while to realize is that we didn't know what we didn't know. So there was a lot of experimentation that was done to figure out what changes were needed. So yes, we probably could have done this using the external projects. It would have been harder. We would probably still be working on it. Whether that was a wise choice or not, time will, time will see. Um, and finally, you know, we, have, we want to create something that OEMs can at least download, install, and set up with a minimum of fuss. And we want to be able to test everything. So having to say, well, we work with this version of OpenLDAP because we've tested it, but if they update it, it may break things and we don't know. It's very hard to test the whole system as a coherent, consistent whole, which if you're going to replace something as complex as Active Directory, you really need to be able to have a testing framework that will test the entire system. Um, and the other nice thing, the other kind of side effect is that having this embedded blob of Samba 4 that's an AD domain controller, it allows other projects to essentially use us as a component without them having to reproduce all the steps of setting up these things separately. And so OpenChange, which is what um, allows Outlook clients to work transparently against Linux and Unix servers um, using all the, the native protocols rather than having to install plugins, that needs Samba 4 as an AD domain controller. And the two, we collaborate closely with that project. Um, they, they essentially use this as part of their um, configuration. And that actually works really well. So now, now we have something that's out there that works. Theoretically, we could revisit this and start doing the work to upstream all the changes we need in the various different product projects and to get everything together so that we can use the existing components. That's going to be a lot of work. And so, you know, if anyone is really interested and has time to start looking at this problem, I would very much welcome people to come along and help us do that. Um, the Samba team is probably, at its maximum, 10 to 15 really active developers, and at minimum, between 5 and 10. And right now, just keeping this monolith running is big enough it's hard enough work. We don't really have the time. We haven't budgeted the time or the staffing to do that. Yes, question. So the question is, do we have code that will synchronize existing open LDAP with the Samba LDAP? Uh, no, we do not. Um, we will synchronize and replicate with Active Directory um, because we use the Microsoft Directory application protocols, which are all DCE RPC based. Uh, you would have to export things in LDIF, you would have to make sure the schemas matched, and then you could re import them um, into Samba. That would be the way you would have to do it. But no, we do not have currently have code to do that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so uh, such code would be very welcome. <laughs> yes, another question. What version of the standard? Mm -hmm. Sorry, with the. Uh huh. 
you have multi-master. Okay. So the question was, what version of LDAP uh, are you implementing? Are you implementing uh, master-slave or multi-master? So I don't think that's actually a change in the LDAP protocol on the wire. That's talking about a change in, in the actual open LDAP code itself. So I'm going to horribly sidestep that question by saying, we do what Windows does. <laughs> so so we, we implement the standard that Microsoft has because... That's the standard that we have to create in order for their clients to work. So it, it, it kind of that. So our, our goal is to have multi-master replication in exactly the same way that Windows does it, which is almost certainly completely incompatible with the way OpenLDAP does it. Would be my answer to that one. So I'm sorry if that sucks, but that's you know. Remember, our goal is to make seamless interoperability with Windows, um, and so that's what we have to do. So a new hope. We may be able to do new things. So right now, we have a bunch of OEMs who ship file server products. What I'm really hoping to do, and if there are people here interested in creating such products, uh, I'd love to talk to you or email me. I'm very easy to find. Um, it would be very nice if people thought about creating directory services products based on top of this code. So a small business server would be an excellent, uh, you know, small business authentication server, um, you know, backend, uh, a Kerberos backend to cloud applications. There are many, many things you can do with this code. Um, and I would really love to help build uh, an ecosystem of OEMs who are building product out of the AD controller in Samba 4. So, uh, and that's, that's kind of a hope at the moment. We, we, have, we have one or two vendors who are doing this on a small scale, I would love to see someone like Cisco or, or someone like that pick it up. And I, I think it might be very useful for them. Um, so, better hurry up a little. Um, file server improvements. As I mentioned, all our fast path IO is now completely asynchronous. Um, and we can keep disk subsystems pretty busy. The core of the code is, um, uh, as I say, a big state machine. Uh, SMB3 now includes transport level encryption. And as Microsoft actually did a really good job of designing SMB3 in that they allow you to turn on very specific features individually. Uh, back when they were doing SMB1, all the features were mingled together. So if you all of a sudden you said you supported one feature, the clients would then start doing a whole host of other features. So you couldn't separate out the pieces you could implement cleanly. With SMB3, they've actually fixed that. You can pick, oh, I'm going to do encryption this week. I'm going to do you know, durable handles next week. You can actually specify by negotiated bits the features of the protocol that you will implement, and the clients obey that. So we now have transport level encryption. That, that's actually, uh, uh, as an aside, a, a quite a funny story that basically the reason that got put in, there, the Microsoft engineers were very, very happy that Samba put transport level encryption into SMB1, uh, which we did have for a while. Uh, unfortunately, the Linux kernel engineers, um, useless as they are, never bothered to implement it in the, uh, in the CIVS client in the kernel, but uh, we've had transport level encryption at the SMB layer for a long time. And apparently, the Microsoft engineers always wanted to put this inside Windows but their security people would never let them do it because they said, oh, IPsec now and forever is the way to do proper encryption. But the fact that we had it in Samba enabled them to leverage with their marketing people and say, well, those guys have it. We have to have it too. <laughs> so they actually finally put transport level encryption in SMB3, which is a very good thing because as, as I'm sure you know, no packet should go over the network unencrypted. Um, we've added support for the new handle types. And the other, the other thing that we spurred them into was um, Tridge, Volker, and some of the other Samba team members created a clustered distributed database called CTDB, which was used for the basis of the scale-out of SONAS, the scale-out NAS product from IBM. And that allowed transparent clustering to multiple nodes, which was something that Microsoft's SMB servers never could do. So this was a brand new thing that was working with Windows clients. Um, and so as in creating SMB3, Microsoft raised the bar. And of course, it was easier for them to do so because they have control of the client code. So they changed the client code to actually make failover, multipath, and a bunch of other enhancements um, to SMB clustering. 
And of course, we've been doing lots of work on scalability and performance, which is still ongoing. Um, so the file server is actually quite nice in, 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 uh, in Samba 4. Um, and, and so we've, we've actually done some process improvements as well. How many people here work on free software projects that have mandatory code review? Not that many. Well, I mean, having worked inside large organizations creating software, mandatory code review is where we're going. And you really need to get there. In terms of quality, at least for a code base as large as Samba, it is the only way you will keep that thing working without breaking and moving forward. So if you're not doing mandatory code review now, think about it and please plan for it. It's a process improvement that you really, really need to be thinking about. Um, no code change is going to any release without a Bugzilla report, sign off by two engineers on the patch, and hopefully a regression test case to go in to fix it as well, uh, to, to make sure that we never regress. Every single commit that goes into the code base has a make, full make test run against it, which tests as many things as we can, including creating a new Active Directory main controller, doing replication, doing uh, file activity to it, a full, doing a full regression test suite, doing all the locking tests. All that has to pass for every single commit. Um, and then we also use, I mean, I must admit we're lucky in this because they've given it to us for free because um, we're a kind of a well-known project, but we have automated scanners and fuzzers running against us all the time. And so this is one of the reasons that we, we, we've passed Coverity's um, our rung two certification for security or whatever. The other thing you have to do, of course, is when those guys give you reports, is you have to read them and fix the bugs. <laughs> A lot of projects get the reports but don't actually do anything with them. We tend to treat those things as a very high priority. So um, responding to the reports, getting um, code fuzzers and scanners run against your code is a very, very good thing. So, better hurry a little. Our relations with Microsoft. So I, I don't know whether anyone read the Samba 4.0 press release, but we actually had a quote, good old Thomas, um, from the director of development uh, of Windows Server. Now, he's not actually praising Sam before. I mean, he, tr he was trying his best, God damn it. His marketing people would only let him go so far. You know, he's, he's praising the fact that their interoperability labs helped us develop it, which is true, absolutely true. But the idea of getting an official quote from Microsoft for a free software release I mean, I'm just staggered by that, uh, especially as the most time, uh, in, in the past, I've been to Brussels more often for lawsuits than I have for FOSDEM. <laughs> so, so the change in, in, in getting that from Microsoft, I think, is very positive, very helpful. Um, and on an engineering basis, um, every, you know, essentially, Every, every year we hang out at the Red Robin in Redmond eating burgers together. So from an engineering point of view, we get on with Microsoft extremely well. We still have a little trouble with their legal and marketing people sometimes, but hopefully that will, hopefully that will change. Um, so yes, I, I'm, I'm actually quite positive and confident about that. Things are getting really, going really well. So what could go wrong? What really worries me? Um, and uh, that's just a, such a wonderful quote because they really are inside the code and they're going to get us. Um, so there are things that worry me about the future of Samba, and you know, I'm going to be honest and I'm going to ask for help with those. So there's POSIX on the edge of the cliff going beep beep, and there's Samba running well beyond it going looking for the Acme parachute, which we know isn't going to work. Um, we now have requirements that are way, way beyond the file systems uh, that Linux and POSIX will provide. We need durable handles. We need direct releasing handles. These are actually some of the same things that NFS v4 needs. But essentially, we're out there in the wilds chopping down you know, the underbrush to try and clear away to get some standards working on Linux. Because these are the things that file systems and you know, proprietary enterprise solutions are selling to people. And so we have to have those too. Linux has to have those things, you know, for file systems, for enterprise storage. We have to have this level of um, failover, reliability. 
And right now, our standards just don't cut it. And it's hard to get new things into the Linux kernel. And of course, the other fear is that, you know, there's us going off the edge and standing there at the back is BSD because they haven't implemented some of the things that Linux has. We don't want to become a Linux-only project. Um, code complexity. Um, it's complicated now. Uh, now, if Tridge, were, uh, if Tridge came out of retirement, there might then be one person who understood the code fully, but without that, there's just us, a bunch of guys, and uh, it's too complex for any one person to fully understand. I mean, I am fearless. I will put bugs into any part of the code in Samba, right? But I don't always know what I'm doing. Uh, I'm confident in the file server. I would be very pushed to fix bugs in the AD controller or some of the LDAP code. Um, so we need more people to work on it. We need more subject matter specialists. We need more experts in various areas of the code. It's a complicated beast now. Um, and it's getting bigger. And then, of course, I, I'm going to leave you a little time to read that. It's probably the best deal that I've, I've read in a very long time. Um, together we can strangle innovation and plunge civilization back into the dark ages. A better description of software patents I have yet to read. Um, so, of course, this is a problem for all software, um, but particularly free software, because our code is out there and people can see. Um, and I don't know whether you've noticed, but a war has started, or begun the patent wars have, to do my Yoda impression. Um, They've all started suing each other. Uh, and, and, you know, any free software project could end up as collateral damage in this really, really ugly war that's going on between the giants. Um, and, you know, it, remember, a corporation, as Simon Phipps once marvelously said, you can't argue ethics with a corporation. It's like talking to a dog. You know, a corporation is, machine, is a machine for making money. It doesn't understand right or wrong. Uh, and there's only the people within it. And if they do something that doesn't make the corporation enough money, they get replaced. So software patents are just a terrible, terrible idea. Uh, and, you know, as Dogbert cleverly points out, we can plunge civilization into the dark ages. So we do, we do have a choice on that. Um, you know, we're doing this to ourselves. And maybe I should have invited the people in the legal track to come and listen to this part. So. And I think I finished perfectly on time. Woohoo! So, yes, question. Some third party software needs schema extensions. Are those supported on Samba 4? Sorry, some third party software needs uh, schema extensions. Like, like Exchange? On Active Directory? Yes, I believe you can do that. You can, you can update the schema in Samba 4 Active Directory. Seymour, correct me if I'm wrong, but. Yes, so um, please, any Windows software that works against Active Directory, please test it against Samba 4. If it doesn't work, it's a bug, and we shall work on it. Any other questions? Hi, I'm Martin Simons. Uh, is it still possible to have an open LDAP backend for the Samba 4 server? So the question is, is it still possible to have an open LDAP backend for Samba 4? No, I'm sorry, it's not. As I, as I mentioned uh, before, that essentially would have been the integration piece, um, and we would have needed many changes in the open LDAP backend. Now, I would like us to be able to do that, but that is, as I said, something that right now we don't have budget, staffing, or time for. So. If people are interested in that, I would love to work with the OpenLDAP people to make that happen. But I, I don't have the time to do that. Okay, any, one, more, one, one last one question, I think we're done. Um, suppose you're in a mixed environment using Microsoft and open source products, and you're slowly replacing the Microsoft products by a Samba product, uh -huh. and eventually you find yourself in a completely open source environment uh -huh. just using Samba. What yep. would the value be and keep using Samba at that point instead of replacing it with something that's maybe better suited for the so, complete open so the source environment? So the question is, when the virus has taken over the host, do you still need the virus? Um, <laughs> no. That's a good way to put it. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> Once you have a completely free and open infrastructure, 
um, using proprietary and weirdly complex variants on protocols is probably a bad idea, and you should probably move to standards-based ones. Good luck. <laughs> All right, and with that, I think I'd better finish. I'm running out of time. Thank you so much for listening.